for the meeting. Certainly, thank you. Trustee Kane. Here. Trustee Collins. Present. Trustee Doke. Here. Trustee Donnelly. Here. Trustee Irwin. Present. Trustee Gardner. Present. Trustee Eustis. Trustee McMahon. Yeah, here. Trustee Martin. Here. <clears throat> Trustee Riley. Here. That is all committee members present, except for Trustee Eustis. Okay, and were, were we expecting Trustee Eustis? We were. Okay, well, he'll hopefully join us shortly. Uh, we do have a full agenda, and uh, during the course of the last week, uh, we kind of looked at the agenda and made a few changes in terms of the order. The biggest change being that the, uh, the, the topic that was number one, uh, the renaming of the CC Little Building has now been moved, and hopefully you've all caught up with that, it's been moved to just before we go into executive session at the end of uh, the meeting today, and that's to accommodate the time for some people who are going to speak at that on that topic. The other thing we'll do, uh, some of you may have heard as we were talking just before the start of the meeting, we'll take a, we'll go into our executive committee meeting right at the end of, uh, of, the, uh, of that discussion on, on the building name uh, removal, and we'll take a short break in the executive committee meeting at that point. Um, so with that, uh, we'll start uh, our first tab and our first agenda item will be the university uh, credit union lease authorization request from the University of Maine. Uh, I see I see Joan, President Junior Monday is on or was on, uh, but I believe it's gonna go over to Kendra and Claire. Are you folks on? I believe they're there. Yes. Claire? Yep, there's Kendra. Kendra, okay. Yep. So this is a, 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 a motion or a request to uh, correct an oversight from the past in that the uh, lease with the credit union for space in our Memorial Union um, started a, a while ago. It was a five year term. And at that point it should have uh, gone to the FFT and the board, but it did not, it was an oversight. And then uh, it got um, a second one. So we are, are basically in year 11 of a, of a lease. Um, and the second lease included a two year extension. So it is our intention after the end of that two year extension to uh, uh, come up with a lease that will go before the board and trustees, uh, you and the board of trustees. So this is actually a correction of an oversight. Okay. So this is not extending a new lease. This is just, as you just said, correction of the oversight and they'll be, you'll be coming back with another lease request. We, we are in an extension period. The two five-year terms have ended and the second contract, our lease had a two-year extension and that's where we are now. And so we are correcting the past and then it is, as you say, our intention to come forward in about a year or so with a, uh, a more long-term lease that will fit all of the requirements. Okay, thank you. Uh, any, any questions or discussions from uh, any of the board? the FFT committee members. Yeah, Mr. Chair? Yes. Yeah. Just curious, at the end of the lease, do we put it out to other financial institutions to see if they're interested in bidding on that uh, location? Or how does that work? Is it uh, dedicated to this one entity? Or do the other 40 or 50 entities in the state have an opportunity? At the, uh, uh, if I can answer, um, uh, when when we first put it in, we actually did not limit it to financial institution and FF um, or a request for an RFP went out for any, any institution. We limited because we have our own food service here in the union, uh, we eliminated any opportunity for a food vendor, but we did put it out to, to anybody that wanted to have space in the union and we had a committee that evaluated it and the credit union won that bid. Uh, Bank or Savings Bank, as an example, was another bidder um, but the committee that was uh, in place at the time to evaluate the um, benefits of each proposal uh, selected the credit union. 
Thank you. I'm I'm sorry. I didn't realize my employer was another bidder on that, or I wouldn't have asked the question. Um, <laughs> I'll recuse myself from further discussion on this one. I'm so sorry. Oh, any other any other questions or comments? Okay, seeing none, I'll I'll read the uh, the resolution. Uh, let's see here. <clears throat> that the board of trustees acting through the finance facilities and technology committee authorizes the University of Maine system, acting through the University of Maine to extend a lease to, with the University Credit Union for a period of two years and a total value of approximately $56,468, subject to review and approval of all final terms and conditions by the University of Maine system treasurer and general counsel. Any, any one last chance here? Any other any questions on this motion? I move the resolution. Second. Moved move by Trustee Collins and seconded by uh, was it Trish. Yep. Trish, Trustee Riley. <clears throat> Ellen, could you take a, a roll call? Certainly. Trustee Kane. Yes. Trustee Collins. Yes. Trustee Doak. Yes. Trustee Donnelly. I'm going to uh, abstain. Trustee Irwin. Yes. Trustee Gardner. Yes. Has Trustee Eustace joined us? Trustee McMahon? Yes. Trustee Martin? Yes. Trustee Riley? Yes. The motion is carried. Thank you. So we'll move to the second tab uh, in our book. And this one is uh, Let's make sure I'm on the right page here. Uh, temporary, uh, excuse me, I see it. Yeah, temporary kitchen space uh, lease for uh, the University of Southern Maine. And I believe, Alec, I saw you on earlier. I thought I did, anyways. Yes, Maybe I'm your chair, Gardner. Hi, Alec. Well, you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna cover this topic for us. Yeah, absolutely. Good morning, everyone. Alec Porches, Chief Operating Officer and Chief Business Officer for the University of Southern Maine. Uh, for this agenda item, USM is seeking to lease to Portland Square, that's the former Walters restaurant in Portland's Old Port, for 35 months to temporarily uh, relocate Sodexo's kitchen. Um, Sodexo serves both our Portland and our Gorham campuses from kitchens located on those campuses. The Portland kitchen is in the Woodbury Student Center. That will be uh, going away um, as early as December when we vacate it. Um, we will be demolishing Woodbury Student Center when we build the new residence hall and the Career and Student Success Center. So we need to find a new space for the kitchen. Um, we looked at several alternatives that I'll talk about in a minute, but just wanted to first say a little bit about the, the lease deal. Um, as I said, it would be 35 months uh, beginning in November, uh, $26 a square foot. Total cost for the lease is just a little more than 400,000. You'll note in your materials that $424,300 figure. We had done the math over 36 months. We were still finalizing the terms of the lease that we'd like to enter into when the materials were submitted. We're now looking at a 35 month lease, so the figure is closer to 408,000. Um, we looked at several alternatives. We started by looking at modular units on the Portland campus, putting one close to our Pace and Smith building on what we call our academic quad. Ultimately, that was um, looking pretty costly. The figure um, we had as an estimate was about 700,000. Um, and it was going to be really cumbersome from a logistics standpoint. The second alternative we looked at was Sullivan Gym, um, located right on the Portland campus. Um, it, it looked like a decent alternative, um, absent others. Ultimately, though, the cost for doing that would be significantly more than this. It's 491000 was a figure we used for construction, um, and then another 77000 that we were estimating for um, waste removal, utilities, and the like. So you end up with a delta of uh, you know, more than 150000 between the two options. Um, 
beyond that, you're really shoehorning a kitchen into Sullivan. We were going to build it um, when we were considering that on the uh, squash and racquetball courts. So it's obviously not a kitchen facility. You're building it on a temporary basis so for a couple of years and then need to turn it back around. And, and the other piece of, regarding logistics is that's that Sullivan area on campus is going to be surrounded by a construction site in the not too distant future having a lot of trucks and so forth delivering food supplies um, to that area we could do it but it would prove pretty challenging um, all of those led us to look at you know off-campus restaurants um, that you know had closed recently had kitchen facilities that might be available uh, Walter showed up as a really good option it, it's turnkey Sodexo's comment to us was it's actually better than the facility they're using now in Woodbury so they're enthusiastic about that kitchen space they'd be making two to three trips a day to campus they don't think it'll be that challenging logistically and we've factored those costs any transportation and fuel into our overall estimate um, so that's what we're looking at for the time being we're hoping to enter into that lease and we're uh, requesting uh, permission from the committee to do so Thank you, Alex. Uh, any uh, questions on this from any of the committee members? Trustee, Trustee Donnelly, yes. Um, first, did Bangor Savings bid on this? Just making a joke. <laughs> oh, just making a joke. Oh, I'm still on mute. Aren't I? Uh, I and uh, there you go. My, my question is, will this have, will we be serving any of the public or competing with any of the local restaurants in Old Town or is this exclusively for serving the campus? At the moment, it, we are thinking of it, Trustee Donnelly, as serving our campus. I think Sodexo would have the option to have a retail outlet if they wanted to do that. I know they have an interest in it. If that is objectionable to the committee, I think that's something we could work with them on. Our interest, of course, is serving our Portland campus. Is there, a, I didn't, I guess I didn't realize that they could, could also do a retail outlet there. What, is there any view from anyone on that, on that particular point or what's the campus think about that? From our standpoint, Trustee Gardner, I, I think, you know, we don't have a strong view. One thing that I've heard suggested is that USM students could go downtown and use their Husky Bucks at that location, which I think is reasonably attractive to us. Um, the old Walter space is a really nice location if folks ever had a chance to eat there in the past. Um, so I can see why Sodexo would be interested in using it as a retail space. Um, it really hasn't been the focus of our consideration in terms of why we would enter into this lease and what the benefit for us is. Um, I, I think if, you know, if it wasn't viewed as objectionable in terms of the public sector, you know, competing with the private sector, um, then we wouldn't, you know, we wouldn't object to it. On the other hand, I think that's a reasonable consideration. Mr. Chair, I, yeah. I think in this environment where uh, restaurants have been particularly hard hit, the message we might be sending by doing uh, competition with them that would feel subsidized it, subsidized uh, mm -hmm. to them would uh, would not be the kind of uh, press or um, reach out into the community that I would hope for for us. Mm -hmm. um, so I would I would uh, deeply caution uh, all around that and even ask that we um, keep that unless there is an educational component for the students that are working there and you can kind of build something around. But having the Husky Bucks and having students have access to it is different than competing uh, with the local restaurants, which it is surrounded with. And uh, from my perspective, most hospitality restaurants are, are in pretty difficult condition right now, and I'd rather not exasperate it. Good points. Any other views on that? Uh, yeah, I have a view on, on, on that. This is uh, Kelly. Sodesco has, has opened uh, their doors. I don't think they're actively advertising, but uh, people from the community uh, go eat at uh, Nowlin Hall at UMFK, 
Um, it's just another option for people. I don't think it's taken over, um, but it's an option for people if they'd like to go there and, and you know, so I, I don't think there's anything wrong with it. I, I would actually, you know, if they, if they were actually actively advertising and, and bringing people away from other restaurants, but I don't really see, um, with the exception of their offerings, price-wise, everything else is in line. So just another, uh, another selection for, uh, for people for, uh, for a restaurant. So, but I, I do agree if it was advertising and, and, and it was, you know, much less, um, and it was dragging a lot of people there that it's probably not a good time, but, um, I, I don't object to people having a choice to be able to eat, uh, at, uh, at the, the college facilities. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, Trish? I think you're on mute, Trish. I um, apologize. I would share um, Jim's concerns, um, particularly given Portland. I think it's different, Kelly, than the market in, in Portland is such a, so many restaurants and so many having difficulty. I would share the concern that we compete. And I'd also be concerned about anything that encourages students to roam around town. I think um, given COVID, there's great concerns about spread and whether there's compliance with the CDC guidance. So I think Jim's cautions are well-founded. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I think Trustee Dope, did you want to? Uh, maybe on mute. Yeah, no, sorry, I'm all set. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> it sounds like that there's a kind of a general consensus uh, that we should probably restrict or, or be careful about having a lease where they where we're actually subsidizing or setting up the opportunity for them to compete in the restaurant market in, in downtown Portland. So uh, if if I'm reading that wrong from the groups, please somebody offer a different view. But if that is a, the view, then I think we do want to have that restriction put in, or at least con some consideration of that as as this moves forward. Um, well, I'll take it. I just ask a clarifying question. Yes, go ahead. So, I just want to understand reading this. This is a this is because of this is the need for a temporary kitchen. Correct. For at the most 36 months. Okay, so that's a fair amount of time. But is there a um I guess I'm just a, a temporary kitchen to serve campus meals feels different than a Portland restaurant. And I guess what I'm looking, maybe Alec, you can speak to this about, about how they're envisioning the space. Because if it's truly a kitchen to serve campus meals, right? right that's very different I than the old port. Um, granted, I don't live there, so I, I don't really know a lot of the restaurants, but the, um, I guess it does feel different. A temporary kitchen to serve campus meals feels different than setting up a storefront. And I think where we're where it's lost is it's not really clear. The campus piece is clear here. The other piece of it is not. So can you maybe just talk about sort of what the conversations have been and if you did if if what you said around you know using Husky Bucks in town is has been part of the vision. What does that look like? Because that that feels like a different level of renovation of a space. It feels like it need, would need branding. It feels like it would need a storefront versus the phrase temporary kitchen, right? To serve campus meals. And I think that's where my disconnect is. Yeah, Trustee Kane, I appreciate those points. I think they're good ones. Uh, just to take you back maybe through the conversation. So initially we were talking with Sodexo about converting that space in Sullivan Gym to be their temporary kitchen. And that's where we get the estimate for the construction and so forth. As we evaluated that option and it just became clear that that would not be ideal and that a restaurant space might actually serve us a lot better from a turnkey perspective. Um, and then we arrived at Walters. We get to the point where that was USM's preferred alternative 
Um, as we discussed it with Sodexo, they liked the idea as well. Um, looking at Walters, I think the wheels started turning for Sodexo. You know, they're an entrepreneurial operation. They looked at it, gee, this is actually a really nice restaurant space. Perhaps we could use this in the future as a storefront as well. Perhaps it could be something where USM students could be downtown using Husky Bucks. I got the sense um, from what I heard from Sodexo that that would not be imminent. They wouldn't be opening a storefront from day one, um, that it could be down the road, and they didn't offer any specifics from it. I, I don't think with them that it was anything more than an ancillary benefit and potential option because originally we were going to use the Sullivan space, which obviously would not have a storefront option. And this is just in lieu of that with a better deal financially um, and more advantageous logistics for us. So I, I don't think that the storefront is a developed idea um, from them at this point, um, nor an expectation if I were to go back. And I, I would, if the committee um, you know, wants to go in that direction, I would want to go back to Sodexo and just say, this is the feedback we received, we want to make sure that, you know, you and, and the group leasing this are, are okay with that. But it was not the reason we entered into this. And it really, it's certainly not um, a significant concern for USM. Our major concern here is that we just get to relocate that kitchen on a temporary basis and do it in a way that, you know, is financially feasible and it works logistically. I'm happy to say more about that, but that's kind of the feeling I got so far. Mr. Chair, this is Glenn. Um, I just wanted to add that, uh, that our negotiations have been almost primarily, almost exclusively focused on how we get a food service during the construction period into USM. Uh, we have not explored deeply what they mean by a possible storefront. It sounds like the will of the committee, which, which uh, I think we're very supportive of, is that it would not it would have a non compete with uh, local restaurants. So uh, I think we we certainly as if uh, you were to give us permission, we would uh, and we would check that and make sure that uh, everybody is comfortable. But we would have a a non compete uh, component of our lease uh, agreements with with Sodexo and with that space. So. I, I think that from our point of view, we're, we're agnostic about Sodexo's uh, larger business plan. We just want to make sure that it serves our students. So if that is the will of the committee, I think we can execute that. Thank you, President Cummins. I, I do, uh, well, if, if it's not the will, uh, if somebody's got a stronger feeling, please speak up. But I, I am sensing that is kind of the direction we're headed. So um, if you would, pursue that and talk about it. If it comes before the board, that would be good at that point. Absolutely, Chair Gardner, happy to do it. And like I said, that's really not our focus as president just reiterated. So I don't see that as being an issue. All right, thanks. Yeah, we, and we will circle back with the board to make sure that everybody's comfortable with that. So. Okay, with that as the back, backdrop, then I'll read the resolution and we'll see if we can move this forward. Uh, <clears throat> the Texas resolution is that the Board of Trustees, acting through the Finance and Facilities and Technology Committee, authorizes the University of Maine system, acting through the University of Southern Maine, to lease space located at 2 Portland Square from the North River 4 LLC for the use of temporary kitchen space for a Sodexo during the construction of the new Portland Residence Hall and Career and Student Success Center. The final terms, including the rate associated costs in other terms shall be negotiated by the University of Southern Maine in the best economic interests of the university, subject to the review and approval of the University of Maine System Vice Chancellor of Finance and Administration and the University Council. Could I have a motion? So moved. So moved. Trustee Kane, moved. Second. Second. Uh, Trustee Donnelly, I think, was first on the second there. Ellen, could we take a, a roll call? Could I, this is Trustee Urich, could I ask a question? Um, is this, this is not going to the board. This is a this is a approval by this committee acting for the board. Oh, so know. if we want to, um, yep, right. we want to make sure that there's a, a non-compete provision in the lease, I, I think we need to say so. 
So with that in mind, I guess I would, I would offer an amendment to this at the end, uh, simply saying that, that the lease shall contain language um, assuring that Sodexo will not uh, um, compete with area restaurants uh, from its location in the old borders, you know, something to that effect. Good. Good point. I'm happy, uh, I'm happy to accept that amendment to the motion. Yeah. <laughs> I am as well. Yeah. yeah you're right. Okay. okay, so we have it amended and you're right. I, I thought this one was going to the board. I'm sorry about that. Thank you for the correction. Um, so the amendment is that you would you say it again, Jim, and we'll just make sure we're all. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to ask Ellen, I hate to put you on the spot. Did you get the language? I did. I did. Can you that read the, it back? Certainly. Um, to add at the end that the lease shall contain language that Sodexo will not compete with local restaurants. From from the from this location. From the, okay. Yeah. That way it's pretty specific if they have other spots. What what does that mean? Does that mean that um somebody from the outside cannot eat there or they're just not going to pursue it. I think it means that they it will not be open to the public from that location that the intent from what I understood from what Alec walked us through was to serve as a kitchen for the campus and they'll do that um, as uh, they'll they'll continue with the primary uh, reason that we're in this negotiation with them, but not pursue the other opportunity they were leaving the door open to from this location. And if I could, uh, I would I would note that the, the language that I put in for uh, an amendment is not is not intended to be the language that goes into the lease. So obviously. Um, the system will um, seek language that's you know better suited and more accurately uh, accomplishes the goal that we're getting across here. Our point is simply to provide that guidance, that, uh, and I think this language is sufficient for that. Yeah, I think President Cummings used the the term that might wind up in the lease as a, a non compete um, with local restaurants, so it, it gets fairly specific, but I never want to talk about legal jargon with uh, and this one of the uh, best lawyers in America. <laughs> no risk of that here. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so the motion was uh, amended, but it's also been moved. Uh, can we take a, a vote on this? Certainly. Trustee King. Yes. Hey, yes. Trustee Collins. Yes. Trustee Doak. Yes. Trustee Donnelly. Yes. Trustee Irwin. Yes. Trustee Gardner. Yes. Trustee McMahon. Yes. Trustee Martin. Yes. Trustee Riley. Yes. The motion is carried. Thank you. Uh, the next tab is a is the university credit union lease authorization request from the University of Maine at Presque Isle. Uh, I think Ben Char, I saw her earlier. Is there? Uh, yes, Chair Gardner. Are you going to you going to cover this? Yes, yes, Chair, I am. Uh, just a uh, similar item. Uh, we actually have two before you today, lease renewal requests. Uh, this one similar to the UMaine one from uh, at the beginning of the meeting. Uh, but in the same fashion, the University of Maine Presque Isle is looking to extend the current lease for two years with the University Credit Union at our location. They have a, an office space of about 145 square feet on the campus. It's located in our campus center. Uh, the re rental rate for the uh, extension, similar to the, the, map, the lease that had been in place before, uh, is $6,300 per year or $12,600 12, for the, the term of the extension. Uh, at which time we would then be looking to do a new lease uh, with UCU, but also looking into some of the points that Trustee Donnelly uh, mentioned during the, the prior discussion on this lease. Um, this lease would be effective. It's, a, it's actually, would, we're, we're catching up here a bit on both of these, uh, would 
have an effective date of August 1 uh, and would terminate two years later on July 31st of 2022. Uh, this obviously is a benefit to our community, both the campus community and the local community where we have a lot of uh, alumni in our area. They use this, uh, this branch quite frequently. Overall, we've been in uh, partnership at this location with the UCU for a period of 13 years. Um, and again, this is in our, our campus center, has an automated teller machine uh, that the, the public and our campus groups use frequently. Uh, they've also been an active participant in our campus. The, the local manager participates in all our recognition events for employees and other planning events such as homecoming. Um, so again, a, a good benefit to, to us here. So again, two year lease request renewal um, before you today and happy to take any questions. Thank you. Uh, questions for Ben? All right, seeing, seeing none or hearing none, I'll read the uh, resolution. Uh, it is that the, that the Board of Trustees acting through the Finance Facilities and Technology Committee authorizes the University of Maine system, acting through the University of Maine at Presque Isle to extend the lease, a lease with the University Credit Union for a period of two years for a total of $12,600, subject to review and approval of all final terms and conditions by the University of Maine System Treasurer and General Counsel. Can so moved. Motion? So moved. By Trustee Riley. Second. Oh, yeah. Second. Second. By Trustee Kane. Just a quick question, Mr. Chair. Ben, Bangor Savings hasn't bid on anything like that. I can vote on this one. Yes, uh, Trustee right. Donnelly, I believe you can. I am not aware of any involvement by Bangor Savings. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Sorry about that, guys. I just don't want to yeah. step on my tongue again. Yeah. All righty, Alan, can you uh, take a roll call? Well, Certainly. Trustee Kane? Yes. Trustee Collins? Yes. Trustee Doak? Yes. Trustee Donnelly? Yes. Trustee Irwin? Trustee Irwin, you might be on mute. Trustee Gardner. Yes. Trustee McMahon. Yes. Yeah. Trustee Martin. Yes. And Trustee Riley. Yes. The motion is carried. Thank you. Okay, the next, uh, next one is tab five in the original agenda. <clears throat> Let's see, uh, Northern Maine Community College Holton Higher Education Center lease renewal at the University of Maine Presque Isle. And, and Ben, I believe this is you again. Yes, sir, this is me again. Um, just another lease renewal here. This again with our neighboring, neighboring educational institution, Northern Maine Community College. They lease space from us at our center in Holton, the Holton Higher Education Center. Uh, they have a total of 634 square feet in that center. Uh, this consists of both an office uh, for them as well as a classroom space that they use to, uh, to provide their offerings. Uh, again, this is an extension of a, a lease that is already in place. This is a one-year extension, uh, the second of two one-year extensions, putting it over the five-year mark or to the total of a five-year mark, excuse me, um, bringing it to this committee uh, for consideration. The lease here would be for uh, a total of 3000 for the additional year and then an additional $1,900 for custodial charges, uh, bringing the total payment that we would receive for the year from Northern Maine Community College to 4902 um, we have been renting this space to Northern Maine Community College for a period of four years. This would bring it to five, as I mentioned. Um, and again, this is located at the Holton Higher Education Center, and this allows both UMPI and uh, the Northern Maine Community College to collaborate on our offerings and really provide pathways for students in that region of Aroostook County. Uh, and again, uh, a one-year lease renewal here uh, for their space um, and happy to take any questions. Thank you, Ben. Uh, any questions on this? Uh, Trustee Riley? 
I, I would just say this is a, it was a pleasure to read this and to see this kind of collaboration between the university and the community colleges. And I thought it was a, a, a plus I didn't know about. And I would, I would move the recommendation. Thank you, Trustee Rowley. Do we have a second? Second. Trustee Doak, thank you. I'll read the resolution. That the Board of Trustees acting through the Finance and Facility and Technology Committee authorizes the University of Maine system acting through the University of Maine at Presque Isle to renew a lease with the Northern Maine Community College for a period of one year, subject to review and approval of all final terms and, act and conditions by the University of Maine system treasurer and general counsel. Any last questions or points on this one? All right, uh, Helen, can we have a vote? Roll call vote. Certainly. Trustee King. Yes. Trustee Collins. Yes. Trustee Doak. Yes. Trustee Donnelly. Yes. Trustee Irwin. Yes. Trustee Gardner. Yes. Trustee McMahon. Yes. Trustee Martin. Yes. Trustee Riley. Yes. The motion is carried. Thank you. Oh, Mr. Chair. Yes. Could I just uh, take a moment to uh, thank uh, Trustee Mishu, whose efforts many years ago made these uh, partnerships possible that Trustee Riley noted. So um, he was integral for this being able to happen and a great model for the university system. Yes, thank you, President Rice. Yeah, it is, it's, it's very good. We, we need more of it across the system where we can. All righty, um, we'll move to tab six, the optical uh, optical network equipment refresh for the Northern Ring of the University of Maine system. And uh, this one I believe is gonna be covered by David Demers. Dave? Yes, thank you, Chair Gardner. Yes. Um, we are presenting to you today an initiative to do some required maintenance on our main research and education network, particularly the optical network that connects the northern region of the state. Uh, the main REN is the backbone that connects all of our educational institutions to the rest of the world. Uh, so I've invited our executive director of Network Maine, Mr. Jeff Letourno, to talk a little bit about what we're asking for uh, with this $1.35 million investment. So Jeff, will you please uh, take it away. Sure, thank you. Uh, as David uh, mentioned, um, the research and education network that we run to connect together all the university main system locations as well as um, the vast majority of K-12 schools and public libraries along with um, various research partners um, was first put together or pulled together in the 2000 six to 2008 timeframe. We are at the point uh, where we're going through an equipment refresh cycle. Um, this request here today is very similar to the request we made back in 2017 when we refreshed the equipment, basically from Farmington, Orono, Ellsworth South. Um, we did a very similar request and about twice the size of this one to refresh that equipment. Um, the Northern Ring represents uh, connect the, the counties, excuse me, of, of uh, Washington, Aroostook, and Northern Penobscot. So what this um, upgrade will do, refresh will do, will allow us to um, better serve those institutions uh, in those counties. Right now, the equipment that we have in place um, is going what's called in the industry end of life. In other words, the equipment manufacturer no longer supports it um, as of two months from now, um, November of 2020. So we've gotten quite quite a bit of uh, mileage out of, out of the equipment. Um, today, um, we're further limited, not, not only with the risk that we run once it goes into support, but we're limited in being able to provide additional capacity on the network in the Northern Ring. Um, Modern equipment, to give you some sense, um, does or provisions um, bandwidth in 100 gigabit per second chunks, um, which um, 
about a thousand times faster than what you would typically have with your cable modem um, at home. And the equipment we have in place in the northern ring um, does it in 10 gigabit per second chunks. Um, so there's, while we have them today inter, interface with each other, um, we're not able to deliver um, the same type of capacity and um, ability and flexibility in the northern ring. Um, the funding that we um, plan to use uh, with the, for this upgrade comes from the fees we collect from non-university admin system entities that make use of the network. So as we have other um, research institution, private uh, higher ed institutions, K-12 schools and whatnot, um, funding from all those entities um, gets set aside to be able to fund these periodic equipment refreshes. Um, we have collected the funds enough to be able to afford or, or you know, to be able to pay for um, the connectivity up into the Northern Maine. Um, we uh, anticipate that uh, it'll take a, a approximately six months to install this equipment from the point of the equipment purchase order release um, to actually putting the equipment up into production. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions you may have about this initiative. Thank you. Any questions? Comments? Hey. Alrighty, uh, I think it seems like uh, the right thing to do and certainly with the equipment uh, coming to the end of its supported life, uh, it's, it's gonna need to be updated. So I'll read the, uh, I'll read the text of the resolution and, uh, and that is that the, the Finance Facilities and Technology Committee forward this item to the consent agenda at the September 28th 2020 Board of Trustees meeting for the approval of the following resolution. That the Board of Trustees accept the recommendation of the Finance, Facilities, and Technology Committee, authorize the University of Maine system to expend up to 1,350,000 to replace the optical network equipment in Northern and Down East Maine with funding from existing sources derived from fees collected from non-University of Maine system entities connected to the optical network along with the previously allocated capital project funds to upgrade the network equipment for University of Maine, Machias, University of Maine, Fort Kent, and University of Maine, Prescott. I move the resolution. Second. Moved by Trustee Collins and seconded by Trustee Donnelly. Ellen, could you take a, a roll call vote, please? Certainly, Trustee Kane. Yes. Trustee Collins? Yes. Trustee Doke? Yes. Trustee Donnelly? Yes. Trustee Irwin? Yes. Trustee Gardner? Yes. Trustee McMahon? Yes. Trustee Martin? Yes. Trustee Riley? Yes. The motion is carried. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much and uh, congratulations, Jeff. Thank you. Okay, the next, uh, next topic is the review of the IT projects with a value of uh, greater than 250,000. Uh, and uh, I think Dave, that's gonna be you on this one. That is, thank you, Chair Gardner. And um, the list of projects seems to have grown and I know we are short of time. So I'm gonna go through this as quick as humanly possible. And I'm gonna to try to just hit a few of the highlights. I believe you all have the slides that are included in your packet. Um, you've seen the format before. Uh, the first issue or the first item is the classrooms for the future. Uh, we are just buttoning up some final installation work and this one will be closed uh, imminently. Uh, but all of the rooms that were earmarked for phase one renovation are more or less complete. Uh, so again, some remaining uh, punch list items at a few campuses, but this really set the foundation for the next project on the list, which is uh, getting the summer web conferencing upgrades uh, in place. And I'm gonna talk about that next. 
The web conferencing uh, initiative represents the $2.5 million investment that the board approved uh, earlier this year uh, to allow us to have greater visibility or greater access from remote locations to in-person classroom instruction, leveraging tools like Zoom. Uh, because we had already done some upgrades to a majority of our classrooms, we went in and made sure that those had video cameras and appropriate microphones to allow that type of connectivity. Um, since the report was published in August, uh, I did go through and update this table. So this appears a little differently from, than the data that you have. So that table shows you the number of rooms that we were hoping to get done this summer. The uh, numbers in parentheses includes the numbers that were completed, uh, the rooms that were completed on time. We had a very aggressive timeline with this. We had a lot of dominoes that had to fall in the appropriate sequence to pull this off. Um, our biggest challenge was supply chain limitation, particularly for video cameras. Uh, during the pandemic, um, Lo and behold, there's been a run on video cameras and microphones, and many of you who own businesses probably are experiencing that same pain point. Um, but we were able to complete a, a significant number of rooms. Uh, they are online as of the first day of classes on Monday. Um, and then we also delivered a number of portable carts for rooms where the equipment that we had installed previously uh, would not support robust video conferencing. So at the end of the day, we have made an impact. We have provided provided a number of rules to provide flexible teaching options, and we will continue to push through and hope to complete the remaining rooms that were earmarked uh, over the winter break. On the wireless infrastructure page, we continue to march toward completion on this one as well. The majority of work has been done. Uh, a few uh, items at USM in particular, including uh, Costello Complex, we're about 20% done in that facility. And we are uh, doing some network equipment upgrades at LAC. And that equipment will be portable um, if need be. Uh, and then Sullivan Gym, as you may recall, was taken offline to support um, or to provide home homeless shelter uh, for the Portland community over the um, some spring term. So we were unable to commence with work there. So that is work uh, that now is underway. Uh, we expect that this will all be wrapped up um, by the time we reach the end of the calendar year. And uh, I'll be able to close this report out as well. On the Main Street improvements, uh, I'm going to focus on the UX enhancements. Uh, last time I reported that we had done some initial pilot testing with a sub, uh, smaller population of students and sent out some surveys in terms of their satisfaction with the new interface available in the platform. Uh, I shared some of those results with you. They were all overwhelmingly positive, and we are moving forward with rolling this out. One uh, issue that we wanted to make sure that we had tied up completely is registration through the new interface. Uh, with the current Main Street environment, we're using a somewhat aged um, technology where uh, students, uh, before they can register for classes, have to be assigned a PIN number from their advisor. Uh, so that's supposed to be a trigger to engage with your advisor before you actually register for classes. The newer approach and more modern um, student information systems is a more shopping cart based approach where students put courses they wanna take into a shopping cart, that shopping cart gets sent to the advisor, the advisor approves it and they're registered for those courses. And that's what this new interface is going to provide. Um, but we are still wanting to make sure that we don't disrupt uh, that PIN process or have another way to get around that PIN process. Um, to allow students to register in a timely fashion. So we've expanded the pilot for the fall. We have a larger number of students who are gonna be testing this out and particularly paying attention to their experience registering for courses in the fall. If that goes well, then I think that opens the gates for us to be able to deploy this to the full student population, um, perhaps in the spring. On the VoIP implementation, uh, we continue to uh, chip away at the work on this one at the three campuses, Farmington, Presque Isle, and the University of Southern Maine. Um, I do have the updates on this one. Again, COVID-19 and the inaccessibility of the campus facilities did delay work um, to a large degree. Uh, but at Farmington, we have completed the work in admissions and Franklin Hall. We are wrapping up work in Merrill Hall. And we, uh, more importantly, uh, are planning for final decommissioning of their legacy telephone system 
um, as soon as that work is wrapped up. And that has been a major pain point because uh, there are no longer parts available for that system. And when it crashes, uh, it takes days to get it back up. So this has been a, a huge effort to get that work taken care of and we are very close to being able to eliminate that pain point. At Presque Isle, uh, we've been able to get back into Preble Hall and South Hall will proceed over winter break. And at the University of Southern Maine, we're going building by building on that particular campus, um, Brooks, Wish Camper, and Corthell. Uh, we have substantially completed the rollout of voice over IP handsets in those buildings. Uh, work continues in Glickman Library, Luther Bonnie, Science, Bailey, Upton, and Russell. Uh, we expect that the USM work will spill over uh, past winter break and into the uh, spring term, um, but we are still going to uh, hopefully get a building by building deployment of ha uh, IP handsets at Southern Maine. And we reached a milestone as of Monday. Uh, you might recall that we have made a heavy push with a very aggressive timeline to replace our Blackboard learning management system with Brightspace. And uh, I'm pleased to report we did go live with Brightspace as of Monday. Um, I provided some uh, preliminary information to the presidents yesterday. Um, we have uh, all of the users are in the system. It is working as expected. Um, a few minor hiccups along the way, including uh, making sure that faculty understand that they still have to, just like they did in Blackboard, go in and activate their courses for students to be able to see the content in the, that course. Um, so that's just a communication effort that we know we need to do a bit better job on. But for the most part, we have completed with the initial deployment of Brightspace. Our focus now is on transitioning from Brightspace implementation support into operational support and figuring out how we'll handle um, some of the, the work that comes along with that. Uh, we will continue to roll out faculty training, getting folks familiar with the Brightspace environment, and looking to take fuller advantage of what Brightspace is going to offer, including uh, providing for non-academic programming uh, delivered through the Brightspace platform. So still work to be done, but our major milestone that we were aiming for was achieved successfully, and Brightspace is our official learning management system as of today. So with that, I'm happy to take any questions or address any concerns. Thank you. Uh, questions for Dave? Um, this is this is Clyde Mitchell. Um, not a question, but just um, a compliment and a big thanks from faculty. Um, certainly, Bright Space has is for most of my students a big improvement on on um, Blackboard, and for the IT folks who have done an incredible job getting the web conferencing facilities in the rooms, absolutely amazing. Um, I think certainly some of us faculty have a little bit to learn still. Uh, but it's there and it's working. So thank you very much. We really appreciate it. And the students do as well. Thank you for sharing that, Clyde. I will pass that along to the team. It's been an amazing effort by everyone that was involved. Any other comments or questions? I just have a comment about uh, Brightspace. I, I'm taking an industry course right now and I have the opportunity to be using Brightspace and I'm very impressed. I came from uh, previous industry classes where uh, I was using Blackboard and uh, the ability of the mobile technology, the technology for our mobile devices is outstanding. Um, I, I really like it. I think the students, uh, students will be well served with this platform. Mm -hmm. so thank you. Thank you for all your efforts. Thank you, Trustee Martin. David, I, I just add, I've said it a couple of times in the past, that I, I continue to be very impressed with the amount of work and the quality of the work that you and your team and your folks do in the system. It uh, continues to be an area, I've got a history of a lot of IT projects never coming in on time or never ever hitting 100% complete. <laughs> and uh, you, you, you and your team do a great job of it. So thank you very much. Uh, very much appreciated, thank you. Um, there's nothing here to, uh, on this particular topic to vote is for information. So we'll move to the next, the uh, next agenda item, which is also for information. Um, uh, and this is tab eight, the adapt adaptive reuse of Corbin and Holmes halls and market demand and P3 update. So we'll, this is a couple of, uh, 
couple of people. I don't know, Joan, if you're going to introduce them or if you'd like me to do that. Yes, I, I can go ahead, uh, Chair Gardner. Um, thank you all for, for uh, giving us the chance to talk about this item. Um, I'll introduce Jake Ward, who is the University of Maine Vice President for Innovation and Economic Development to, uh, to provide you with this update and our, our I think, very exciting plans uh, that we hope you'll be interested in for going forward to, uh, to find productive uses for these two beautiful buildings. Jake. Sure. Uh, thank you all for having me here this morning. I'm happy to give this update. Um, um, the um, University of Maine system over the last several years had hired the uh, P3 consultant, uh, Brailsford and Dun Dunlavey, uh, to look at uh, reuse of facilities within the system. We've engaged them to evaluate the potential reuse of two buildings in our historic district, Holmes Hall and Coburn Hall. They are uh, vintage 1888 buildings that are no longer used by the university, but are sound buildings, but would be very expensive to uh, rehab and utilize within our function. So over the last year, B&D has done a, a market analysis and evaluation with the idea of um, going out to the marketplace to find potential developers who could develop them for uses compatible with the university's mission and um, potentially take advantage of historic tax credits and, and reutilize these facilities. Attached to the, the uh, agenda is a detailed report on the market analysis and assessment um, that shows the, the most likely uses are uh, office space and um, uh, boutique hospitality. Uh, the next steps for to move forward with this is uh, what you're undertaking right now is to develop a RFQ, RFI and go out to the marketplace and get to see if there's interested developers based on interest from developers. We would come back to the committee and the board for approval of going through an RFP process, which would likely be in early 2021. I would acknowledge that the, uh, the schedule that we have to go out to um, uh, developers is aggressive for the fall in the sense that it is of great interest to have something in the marketplace as we look at the recovery from the pandemic. The work that B&D has done in already reaching out to certain developers has indicated that um, th th certain segments of uh, the office and hospitality may be some of the first to recover. Um, the, the facilities located on campus provide some unique opportunities, especially in light of um, what um, the how the economy has uh, responded to the pandemic and the interest in having um, facilities that are more remote from bigger cities. I'd be happy to answer any other questions on that. I'm also joined by my colleague Renee Kelly, who is um, a co-lead on this project with me, and we have a, a fairly broad committee representing the University of Maine and the University of Maine system that has been assisting on this project. Mr. Chair? Yes. Hi, Jake. Um, I have a unique perspective on this report and I read it with great interest because for 12 years from 2002 until 2014, I had an office in Holmes Hall. I was one, I was the last remaining person to have an office in Holmes Hall before it was closed for health and safety reasons. <laughs> um, I was there when it when it rained inside the building because all the pipes burst. I was there when it had to be shut down for a gas leak in the basement. I was there when someone was living in the basement because no one was in the building but me uh, for most of the time. And I have great affection for both of these buildings. And for those of you who have not seen them, they are in the middle of campus. They are gorgeous buildings on the outside. And right now on the inside, they are like haunted houses. And um, I say that not having been in them in the last four years, but because they've been closed, but I will say I am very excited about the idea of having a plan for these buildings, which are in the center of campus that are extraordinary from a historical perspective, um, unique in their architecture. And um, my, my work was when I was working in the Honors College, we didn't have enough room for me to be in Colvin Hall, uh, which was another historic building that we had renovated and the difference it made for students, for the campus, for faculty made such a big difference overall. So I just wanted to say, I read this report thinking, oh God, thank God, finally, it's time. Um, I hope that we can move forward with this and look forward to the future updates. Um, I have great affection for these buildings. So I just wanted to offer that unique perspective as someone who has been in those buildings a lot, um, especially in not their best years. 
I would add, I think the last time I was in Holmes Hall was to visit you in your office, so. I am positive that it was, Jake. And what's interesting, I will just say this, so for, for color, color analysis here, is that the Holmes Hall was home of food science and nutrition and large portions of that for decades before they moved over to the renovated, um, uh, big the, the big NSFA renovation, the National, the School of, um, uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, sorry, yes. And they, when they moved over to the their beautiful yeah. labs that are high tech and now creating businesses across the state. And so for a while, they would come over to Holmes Hall to use some of the equipment that had been unable to be moved yet over. So I'd be in my office upstairs by myself in this giant haunted house of a building and somebody downstairs would be like an explosion sound or suddenly an engine would rev up because they were coming back to work on blueberry science and cranberry science. And, um, and it was amazing. So I, I really hope we can find a new, a new chapter for these buildings because they have, they have been a huge part of what has made the university successful from a research perspective and should be a huge part of what moves us forward um, from a sort of, we'll, we'll see perspective. Thank you, Emily. Any, uh, any other comments? I, I, I don't know the two buildings, but I do like the whole idea and the process of finding alternative uses and uses with uh, through a P3 partnership that, that can solve a lot of problems for us down the road if it works out. So, so it's, a, it's a quite, an, I read it with interest and I decided to see where it goes. Great. Thank you. Uh, we'll move to the uh, next agenda item. Let's see here, I'm losing my place. Uh, next one is, a, is tab 10, the capital project status update and the bond projects update. Um, I think the next tab is tab nine, trustee. Oh, wrong nine, I'm sorry. Yep, I was on the wrong page. Tab nine, the Career and Student Success Center, another P3 project down in uh, Portland at the USM. And that one, I will turn it over to President Cummins. Thank you, Chair Governor. Um, we appreciate the, the time. We, um, as uh, as committed, we wanted to circle back, give uh, the FFT committee an update on where we stand. Uh, there's been uh, several, uh, you know, very positive developments. We want to make sure that everybody was aware of those. Um, I'll be doing an outline. Alec uh, Porches will be uh, putting up um, some of the slides that we'll show you today, and I'll give you an update. Um, and we'll uh, answer any questions that you might have about the project and how it is uh, maturing. The first thing I wanna say is that sort of relative to this project uh, is the roundabout project, which uh, the new Dean of the law school has suffered the most uh, of anybody uh, because she is in the midst of a major construction site. So again, I apologize to her, uh, but that project is uh, well underway, started in April. And that actually helps us create more of a private space here on the Portland campus, which is integral to some of the work that we are doing on the Career uh, and Student Success Center, as well as what we call Portland Commons. I want to let you know that uh, parking, uh, we, uh, as we uh, talked about before, uh, I know that's something that came up with FFT about a year ago. I want to make sure that uh, uh, people know that we, uh, we had a very well-developed report then, and we are actually fine-tuning that report as we get closer to the process. Um, just a reminder for some of you who know the vision that you're seeing right now is over the top of 295, kind of in a drone or, or in an airplane looking down uh, what is now a, what that big patch of green is where that new uh, quad would be, as many of you know, um, and that would return a parking space to green space, which is uh, something that aesthetically we think is very important. It's also a major common area for the university. To the right of that is what we call Portland Commons. That's a 577 bed residence hall. Um, that's the P3 that you were just, uh, that uh, Chair Gardner was just talking about and a possible uh, use of that. And we're, so far, we're learning a lot from that relationship. It's been very positive, very productive. So if it can be helpful to other universities, we certainly would share that, um, that experience. And in the center, uh, moving in along that, um, that quad, is uh, our, our um, uh, student success and career center, which the, the voters of the state of Maine help. We're still raising money. We have a, a million dollars that have come in so far in philanthropy. We're hoping to extend that out another four million uh, in order to make sure that we've covered all costs to that student center. 
Um, it, uh, its design, as I've said uh, in the past, is, is sustainable in the sense that, that Portland Commons is using a passive house design, which could greatly limit it, will save us hundreds of thousands of dollars over the course of the, of the, uh, the mortgage payment of 35, 40 years. Uh, so that has a, a, this we expect this will be probably the largest passive house or in the top four or five uh, largest passive house dormitories or residence halls in the country. So next, uh, next slide. So here you get uh, kind of a ground's eye view. For those of you who are familiar with Wish Camper, that top photo is looking straight across uh, Bedford Street into uh, the quad and into the new student center. Uh, that first floor will be dining uh, center. We don't really have anything of that nature on the Portland campus that, where that students can actually eat. It'll have a cafe pub. It will be open to the public, but it primarily used uh, uh, so people off the street could come in and, and buy coffee, et cetera, uh, but it would be primarily for our students. It'd be a fireside uh, lounge where people can congregate. One of the problems that we're having now, particularly with a large number of commuter students, which has gotten even larger since, uh, uh, you know, since the advent of COVID, uh, is that having a space we simply on the Portland campus don't have that many spaces for students to actually gather. The second floor is designed specifically for career services, which is loyal and faithful to what the, the voters have asked us to do. Um, and then the third floor would be student affairs programming, et cetera. Uh, as many of you know, this aligns very strongly with the state economic plan. Uh, it attracts out of state students. It also helps keep main students here. Um, it provides key employers resources to connect directly with our USM students and internships. And it really moves what we will see as a major part of our next five year. Um, many of you helped uh, us participate in that. Our, our five year plan will be very much around career placement, internships, real world experiences, et cetera. Um, and um, I'll stop there just to give you, uh, I'm gonna turn it over to Alec for more detailed analysis or uh, detailed description of, of some of the images and some of the work that we're doing. I will say that we've had our first meeting on, the, uh, on these two buildings and in the, in the redo of the quad with the Portland Planning Committee. We go back uh, in front of them and turn the pl uh, Portland Planning Board. Uh, we go back in front of them on the 22nd, extremely positive. They really liked this. They had a number of small things they wanted. They wanted to know exactly how many trees there might be out on the, on the quad and how many might be in that mini quad inside Portland Commons. They wanted to know if we could screen the uh, mechanicals at the top of the buildings, we can do that. And, uh, and uh, the most pertinent issue for us was or just around making sure that the neighbors were comfortable with parking and we are actually meeting with them uh, to make sure that they will even though parking is not part of this, I think the planning board wanted to make sure that the neighbors were comfortable with our parking proposal. So we are working uh, in even more detail to make sure that we can meet everybody's needs there. So I'm gonna stop right there. I think most of you are familiar with this, but uh, wanted to give you the, the update that we hope by the end of the month to, uh, to have gotten approval from the planning board and our, our, our sort of shovel in the ground date remains uh, in March. We did get pushed back about six months because the planning board was not meeting for a number of months because of COVID. So we got pushed back to, uh, to uh, about six months. So we will be hoping to open or planning to open in the, uh, the late winter, uh, early spring of 2023, rather than the fall of 22. So not a huge pushback given the COVID crisis, but certainly uh, something that uh, we want to make sure that everybody was aware of. So I'll turn it over to Alec, unless there are any general questions uh, before we go into a little bit more detail on the building. If not, I'll turn it over to Alec. <laughs> Thank you very much, President Cummings. So I wanted to just give a bit of an overview and show some renderings as well, just in the spirit of keeping you all updated on what is, as the president says, really a transformative project for the Portland campus. Um, from a timeline standpoint, the project started back in 2018. It's really been a partnership between USM and the University of Maine system um, that, that's gone extremely well. Carolyn McDonough is on the call today and has been leading that University of Maine system team and has just been a terrific partner. So, you know, we at USM have been pleased with that and really grateful for it. Um, project follows closely along our master plan, which the trustees approved back in 2019. Spent the balance of 2019 working through a pretty involved procurement process, ultimately selected Capstone Development Partners as our lead developer. Um, 
we received board approval early this year for our pre-development agreement and we ultimately executed that PDA back in May with Capstone and we've been working off that now we're currently negotiating a development agreement which would come back before the board um, in the future. As the president said, we're engaged in the Portland planning board process right now. We initiated that with the neighborhood meeting back on July 15th. We were in front of the planning board on August 11th for our first workshop and we'll go back in front of the board, we think on September 22nd for a second workshop. So we're really looking forward to that. We do intend to break ground in March of 2021. So that's coming on pretty quickly. First thing we would demolish Woodbury Student Center and our facilities building, which is right on the corner of Bedford and Durham Streets. Um, and then we hope to open in May of 2023. And that's how we're looking at things from a timeline standpoint. Very quickly on the team, as I mentioned, just a really good partnership between USM and the University of Maine System to lead the project. Capstone Development Partners is our developer. SMRT in Portland and Elkis Manfredi of Boston are the lead architects. PC is our construction firm. Capstone Management Partners has been consulting. Woodard and Kern is leading our permitting effort. And Stephen Winter Associates is our passive house consultant. Looking at the uh, residence hall, which we are calling Portland Commons, that is, that is an informal name. We discussed that a little bit in the uh, materials for the committee. Obviously, we would come back to the board for any formal naming, but we are informally referring to the residence hall as Portland Commons. This is a view looking up Bedford Street. I'll show some renderings in just a minute, but I did wanna put this up just so you all have an image of, of what we're talking about um, when we refer to the building. Uh, from 2015 to 2020, USM grew student enrollment by more than 7%. That's led to over-occupancy in our residence halls on the Gorham campus. We're also working with Brailsford and Dunleavy on this project, and they did a market analysis back in 2018 showing that we could add 550 to 600 beds on the Portland campus without cannibalizing Gorham, which was really important to us. So the 577 number fits right into that. Um, we've also known for years that upper division graduate and law school students have had a very difficult time finding housing in Portland. This is going to give them an opportunity to do that at an affordable rate. And from a USM and a system standpoint, it really gives us an opportunity to take advantage of Portland and its national and international appeal in terms of recruiting you know, students to Maine and retaining them here. We think this is really a gem um, that has an opportunity to be developed and, and be very attractive and also really benefit the city of Portland and the state by developing that Portland campus. And the last thing I'd say about the building is that it really balances three key priorities in achieving design excellence affordability, sustainability, and aesthetic appeal. The president talked a little bit about passive house. So when we talk about sustainability, um, that's really what we're referring to. We're paying more for passive house up front. We believe it will pay itself off over time. That's what all of our models show. We also really think that it's just the right thing to do from a sustainability standpoint. It's exciting to know that this is gonna be the largest passive house residential hall in New England, and it's going to be among the top five in the country. Right now, I'm told it's going to be the third largest by the time we complete it. The other thing I'd add from this slide is just that uh, this is the first time we've had residential um, life on the Portland campus. There have been um, dorms in Portland in the past, Portland Hall most recently up on Congress Street. There have been some affiliations, but we've never actually developed residential housing on the Portland campus. So to have this building you know, fronted by a green quad, walkable to all academic buildings and potentially you know, very close to a graduate student center, uh, we really think it is just a terrific way to begin developing that Portland campus. Um, turning to the Career and Student Success Center. Um, again, I'll circle back to this rendering, but this is the uh, what we're calling the CSSC if you were looking across the street from Wish Camper. Um, as the president mentioned, you know, this building is going to fulfill the needs of our growing and increasingly diverse student body. One group that will really benefit from it is commuters who just don't have a good place to go on the Portland campus right now. We think this is going to be an excellent place just for them to be in general um, and certainly for our student body as a whole on the first floor. We'll have about 300 seats for dining, cafe pub as well, and a fireside student lounge, um, in addition to the University Store and Welcome Center. So it's gonna be a really vibrant space. On the second floor, that'll be devoted entirely 
acute career services. Um, we'll have a large multi-purpose event room overlooking the quad. That'll be a great space for career fairs, for meetings, for presentations. And we really just don't have a great resource for that right now. Um, we'll also have all of our career advisors and what we call the career hub up there. Um, and we'll have interview rooms for employers who are visiting campus or for Zoom interviews. And that was something we weren't thinking about, you know, 10, 12 months ago, but now is obviously a very big deal. Um, and you can envision a space where commuters or other residential students could come and have a professional background to do their Zoom interviews in addition to meeting with employers on campus. So it should be an excellent space for that. The third floor will have a student affairs focus. We'll have a diversity and intercultural center that overlooks the campus green. We'll have our student government and student affairs offices up there as well as just student lounges and study spaces. It's meant to be a very welcoming space for our students, very accessible. Um, and the last thing I know, just going back to the president's point about voter support for this project, it, it really comes about with the generous support of Maine voters. Um, and, and we think that our commitment to the project is really responding to that successful passage of question four back in 2018, which of course authorized $49 million in bonding for modernizing university of Maine system facilities to attract and retain students and to develop the state's workforce. And we think this building will do all of that. 19 of that 49 million has been directed to the Career and Student Success Center. Um, that's out of a total $25 million budget. And we are meeting that gap with philanthropy. We have a million in hand and the $5 million goal over the next several years. And I just quoted the president here in terms of what this, uh, project really means for us. This is a quote right after passage of question four. Um, a quote here, for our students, passage of question four will translate to an enhanced learning environment, better preparation for future careers, and more integrated interaction with area employers. For the rest of us, yesterday marked a key date in our steady approach to becoming a truly great university. And we think that really holds up today and just speaks to the project as it stands. Um, just wanted to run through a few quick renderings to give you all a 360 degree view of, of what the buildings, of how they're shaping up and what we expect them to look like. Um, bird's eye view here, if everybody can see my cursor, this is the quad, this is currently a surface parking lot. That's the Career and Student Success Center. And this is the residence hall and you can see a smaller residential quad in here. This of course is Masterton, Wish Camper and Glickman and Osher Map Library. This is the view the president showed earlier. I won't spend a lot of time on it, but it's just a nice aerial looking down on that quad. Um, this is the view I showed earlier. And again, this is looking up Bedford Street. Um, I, I won't spend a lot of time on, on architecture or anything like that, other than to say that you're seeing on these lower wings, five stories, um, primarily cement fiber panel. You can see the vertical bay windows here, punch windows otherwise. Um, and then this is a, uh, an eight story structure. This is the corner of Bedford and Durham streets. And the, uh, if you will, kind of east and north wings are eight stories while the Bedford wing here and then the west wing around the corner that fronts the quad are five stories. And this is more of a basket weave. Um, you're seeing uh, corrugated metal in addition to that cement fiber panel. And then you have the tower here as well. Um, but the thing that really stands out to me about this slide, you know, as much as the architecture it is just the vibrancy of the campus and, and the energy that we expect um, this to generate. It, it is not nearly as energetic if you were to go to our campus on a typical day, um, you know, say last year pre-COVID, um, that you'll see once this is constructed. And you can see this is just across the street from Osher Map Library, looking down Masterton and the, um, and the Skywalk. Because we know it's not always spring in Maine, we challenged our architects to show us something on a gray winter day. And what really stands out to me in this one is just the luminosity coming from the building. You can see how well lit it is all the way along Bedford Street and then these towers up here. Um, this is an area that even, you know, when it's still technically light out on a, on a winter day, it is pretty dark on our campus. And that's going to change dramatically. When we talk about that energy, the luminosity. I think it's really just going to add to the overall attraction. This 
part right up here where you see these windows is going to be called the Husky Sky Lounge, at least for the time being. And that'll be open to anyone. It's just the top floor of the residence hall, but it's a really nice lounge that gives a view out over Portland. Um, it should be, I think, just an attractive feature of the building. This is going back to that spring setting and looking across the street. If you were walking out of Glickman Library, maybe standing between Wish Camper and Osher Map Library, um, looking at what we are calling informally Portland Commons. You can see here that is the cement fiber paneling, um, still finalizing exactly um, you know, what shade that would be and so forth. But I think this gives a good sense. The vertical bay windows I mentioned and the punch windows otherwise. And then the foundation here is a dark and light brick mixture is what the architects have given us. This is looking into the Career and Student Success Center. You can see again this west um, wing of the building, which works out to about five stories, obviously um, descends as you move back in this green, um, you know, the elevation rises a little bit just to meet the natural grade of the land. Um, things I think to note on this building though, are those diagonal uh, mass timber columns, um, and the front, the glass facade right behind it. Um, and the glass facade, interestingly, plays really nicely with the science building behind it. Uh, science building is an attractive one on the USM campus, and we just don't have anything on that side of Bedford Street that marries up with it. We think this will really well. And then one more view, call it a dusk, maybe early fall view of the Career and Student Success Center. Um, again, you can see these mass timber columns that, you know, the architects have described to us as, you know, what they envision as being iconic. And they've talked about this building having a civic appeal, but a modern one where the columns and the way they spread at the base just make it a very inviting space for students. And you can see the wide portico, um, not only a good space for you know, students to, to sit, to pass, what have you, but also um, for events that we'll have, whether it's a speaker standing here, a band playing, you name it, out onto this common. And the quad is about an acre in total space right now. And then lastly, the president showed this early on. Um, this is just as you enter into the uh, Career and Student Success Center. And you can see um, that large staircase that leads up to the second floor of the Career Center. If you followed the cursor, dining would be back behind here. So that's a, a quick walkthrough. Um, just because parking and transportation were so topical, I just wanted to end with a, a quick nod to that and where we are um, with the parking solution so far. So as the president mentioned, we've spent a lot of time uh, working with our consultant VHB to study parking and transportation patterns around the campus with a parking study, a transportation demand management study, and a traffic study at this point. Uh, the most recent development is that we have hired a design firm for the new structured parking, Desmond Design Management is going to be working with us. We had our kickoff meeting on August 10th. The first thing that they're going to do is to conduct the site review plan. Um, we've obviously looked at that Sullivan uh, parking lot space. We think there are a lot of merits to that space. On the other hand, when Desmond was pitching to us in the RFQ process and they highlighted that they like to do a site evaluation, it made sense to us since the timeline permits it to have experts come in um, and either validate our thinking or give us some other recommendations. Um, so that work will be ongoing over the next really four weeks or so. Um, the project is going to have a separate planning board process, but we expect to marry up its opening with the opening of the Career and Student Success Center and the Residence Hall project. Um, and just to wrap things up, I'd say that, you know, the project really is going to fulfill a significant portion of USM's master plan. Um, it's a great start to that plan, and it really does transform USM's Portland campus um, and, and just provides a, a great, you know, frame entry, if you will, with that campus green, um, replacing again what is a surface parking lot today. And I just highlighted those objectives at the bottom of what we're achieving here. One of them is transforming that parking lot. Um, second is creating affordable housing on the USM Portland campus. And if anything, affordable housing is even an even shorter supply in Portland these days. And we think that is critical, not just for our university, but for the city as well. And finally, just balancing design and construction quality with an impactful commitment to sustainability. So um, that's what we had for you. Wanted to keep everybody up to speed on, on where we are and certainly happy to answer any questions.
The only thing I would add, uh, Mr. Chair, if I could, um, many uh, many of the board trustees are able to contribute or talk uh, about our five-year plan, and our five-year plan is very much aligned with this this version of the master plan. Uh, our, we uh, we particularly see the career and student success center as a pivotal part of one of our key features is to take advantage of the ability to get students connected to the employee community, employer community here in the and have opportunities here uh, in the greater Portland area to, to actually take their work in the classroom and move that out into real world activities that, uh, that can help them get jobs, et cetera. So, so uh, we will be um, meeting tomorrow with the chancellor. We'll go over that, uh, that, that uh, five-year plan, but uh, assuming that he's uh, comfortable with it, we'll get it out to you and, and get uh, some feedback from the board of trustees, but I think it aligns well with this master plan. Thank you, President Cummings. Uh, open it up for any discussion or questions from the committee. Uh, Trish, go ahead, Trish. Thank you. It's, Alec, your um, enthusiasm is, is infectious. Um, it's obviously a beautiful initiative. Mm -hmm. Let me ask the cosmic question, though. Um, given, put this in context, given our budgetary issues that are, are not going away anytime soon, given the challenge of occupancy, obviously COVID related in the current projections, given that we don't know what COVID will do to human behavior about you know, where, how people will wanna to go to school in the future, is this too grand? Is, uh, is there any possibility to scale it back? Are we okay to pursue this in its full robust and very exciting model? And I guess that's for the president. Yeah, uh, uh, thank you. Um, there, there, that's a, obviously a question that uh, that we have been working with with many of our consultants. So we started that with uh, Bradsford, uh, Brailsford and Dunleavy. They've been our consultants in this process. We asked them exactly that question, uh, Trustee Riley. Um, you know, what does this mean? What has happened actually, strangely, perhaps a little bit counterintuitive, but what has happened in the Portland market since COVID is that we've actually got more demand for housing from out of state particularly and that market rates and rental rates have actually ironically gone up. Um, so we know that the affordability and the desire to be, uh, to have affordable housing uh, in the Portland area has actually intensified with COVID-19. Uh, the other uh, areas that we've done is we have a supporting council for our USM Foundation. Many of them are real estate developers and we asked them uh, to weigh in whether we were still on target. And their answer was unequivocally yes. As you know, we've had 125% occupancy most of the last five years in the Gorham campus. And so we, we know inherently that we have the, we have a pretty strong um, desire for trying to get into or trying to get, get more housing uh, and also very attractive for some of the upperclassmen students. And this would be for upperclassmen only and graduate and law students uh, would be our top priority. So, so, uh, so we have been very, uh, very sensitive to that question. Uh, we have been looking at third party people who have the technical expertise around the real estate market and around demand. Um, and, uh, and obviously, uh, we, it's continued and someone on the pathology of the disease. Uh, if there are vaccinations in the next year and a half, this works perfectly. If it takes five years to get a vaccination out, uh, you know, there's some vulnerability there. So uh, the Wall Street Journal yesterday was reporting uh, strong and good evidence around the vaccination uh, possibility coming uh, faster than perhaps we were up in the worst case scenario hoping. So, so with all that, it seems uh, the market is still strong. In fact, you could argue it's a little bit stronger than it was when, uh, when you approved it six, uh, um, eight months ago. So Alec, do you wanna talk a little bit about our finances and how that, uh, uh, how that fits into um, uh, the, the um, support for this particular project. Yeah, happy to, President Cummings. And Trustee Riley, certainly appreciate the question. It's been on our mind a lot. And as the president said, you know, when the pandemic hit initially, we did take a pause in general just to review the entire project, both buildings. We did end up scaling back the Career and Student Success Center. Originally, that was a $31 million building. We worked with the system, had a number of good conversations there, scaled it back to a $25 million building, just taking some of the pressure off philanthropy, feeling confident that we could raise the money, but also wanting to make sure we didn't put ourselves in a position where we'd have debt service on that building in addition to operations costs. Um, that's closely related to the residence hall because 
the residence hall at 95% occupancy is a what I would call a very robust financial model. The cash flow looks very good. If you're down at a lower occupancy level, such as 80%, um, it makes it harder to flow cash from that project to other parts of the campus. And we would like to use some of the cash flow to support the operations cost in the Career and Student Success Center. So we were mindful of that in the event that you, know, you need to do that and you have to pay debt service. And I'm pleased that we're gonna avoid that. Um, one thing that's good about the passive house structure and the way we're building this building is that it's easier to socially distance um, in this structure than it would be in our other dorms, specifically because of the bathroom layouts and so forth. One of our challenges right now is we have these group bathrooms where you can have social distance otherwise, but if you have students sharing a bathroom, that can be a challenge in terms of preserving the health and safety on a campus. So it's something that's been on our mind a lot. We've talked with the architects about it quite a bit. Um, as the president said, if we're through the pandemic by the spring of 23, if we're back to normal operations, we're in terrific shape, but I think the contingency planning is solid otherwise as well. Yeah, and I didn't mean to imply, I, I didn't mean to imply that we would still be in the pandemic till tw in 2023, I hope, but I thought it might change human behavior and how they, how people want to go to school. I mean, I think we just don't know. So it makes it- You're absolutely right. Tough, there just is a lot of unknown. And, and only a, a relatively modest uh, percentage, I think everybody knows this, but of, of USM's uh, uh, 8,600 students, uh, we have about on, on a last year, for example, we'd had about 1,400 of them would have been in the dormitory. So we're not quite as dependent financially in our economic model as maybe uh, a school like a, a you know a, a Bowdoin or whatever I, probably not a great comparison but but something like that where almost a hundred percent of the students are in the dormitories. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Uh, Mr. Chairman, one question. Um, it, it, I've been distracted, so I apologize if you addressed this, but I didn't hear it. Um, so. I, I've been enthusiastic about this project for a long time. I'm pleased to see it come to this stage. Uh, the, my question goes to what are we taking offline? I know I know Woodbury goes away and, and the other building goes away, but over some period of time, the board would look to see what what are the what is the space offset that will accompany this, whether it's on that campus or somewhere else at USM. Um, so if you could just address that. Yeah, uh, yeah. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, we have an aggressive demolition schedule that uh, that matches this. Um, obviously, the the twin, the two towers uh, that are uh, Dicky Woods in the Gorham campus goes away, so that's a huge amount of square footage. Uh, we'll also be, as you said, we'll eliminate wood, uh, uh, Woodbury, and we'll eliminate the uh, facilities building behind Woodbury. Um, and I think we have, uh, I know we have, as Alec and I have talked about it, we have several other places where we're looking at demolition. Alec, do you want to add up, there are a couple other uh, square footage eliminations as well. Yeah, there are a number of smaller buildings around campus, Trustee Irwin along Bedford Street and so forth that we would seek to eliminate as well. Uh, the president named the major ones though. Okay, thank you. So as, as you update us in the future about this, um, the, uh, to the extent that those things have moved forward, it, it, it uh, just a suggestion that the board is kept uh, informed as those offsets occur it would be helpful. Thank you. Yeah, we, can we, we can get you a more detailed list of uh, the properties that are underway to be uh, demolished as well. Thanks. Uh, I have one one last question. Uh, yes, uh, maybe Alec or President Cummings, you can have had a had a discussion already in your meetings. But any word yet on uh, potential escalation due to either time from longer supply chains and, and timing issues or escalation in costs? Yet, as you've had your meetings with the with the different developers and partners, yeah, hopefully well, that's not the case. But um, this is usually about the time. In a project, you start to hear about this. Yeah, uh, once you get that contract signed, uh, the contractors have a different view of price point. Um, what, what I can say is that we were worried about the international fluctuations, particularly around steel um, and aluminum. Uh, mm -hmm. Those have actually moderated in price since uh, some, some, some of the tariff discussions a year ago. Uh, and then with COVID, uh, we've actually seen 
uh, aluminum prices and steel prices start to modify from where they were before. Uh, so far, I think our partners, I'm going to let Alec uh, answer, he's, he's in, at the table with them on a weekly basis, but so far, at least uh, Alec has not reported major bump ups in, in any kind of costs at this time, but I'll, I'll let Alec uh, uh, report on that in more detail. Yeah, the, the president's correct. Uh, no increase yet, Chair Gardner, although our conversations are ongoing, I expect to get more information on pricing soon. And it's something we're working with the developer to manage aggressively and just to make sure that we stay within our budgets, because obviously that's what our models are predicated on. Okay. Okay. Uh, the next update probably would be good if you could add a slide on just where, where you think the pricing is compared to the original idea. Hopefully it stays flat or goes down, but the, with inflation and uh, some of the changes going on with supply chains, it's going to be a little bit unpredictable. Yeah, it certainly is and absolutely will do. Thank you. We'll move to the, the next tab, but, and uh, this one is a, uh, the one I jumped over and went to first, and that's the capital project status update uh, and the bond project update from, and it's an update report. So I think it's going to go to Chip and I'm not sure if I saw Chip on. Chip Gavin? Chair Gardner, this is Carolyn McDonough. I don't believe uh, Chip was okay. able to make it today. So he asked me to step in for him. Thank you, Carolyn. You're welcome. Um, so good morning, everyone. Thank you. Uh, the capital project status report uh, before you reflects a total of 22 projects now. Uh, we did remove three projects from the list uh, since the last report and added one that was approved at the last meeting. Um, the the data on the on the, the spreadsheets is as of the end of June. So just as uh, for reference there, uh, especially in relation to construction completion, in some cases that's come up, come a long ways on some of the smaller projects that were uh, in needed for this summer. Um, to your similar along the lines of your question uh, of Alec and uh, President Cummings earlier about impact on construction, I did keep in here a list of uh, impacts that we're seeing on our construction projects. Um, we still have three of four previously held projects uh, remaining on hold. And um, we are seeing some, beginning to see some impacts, some actual costs related to uh, COVID precautions on site. Um, as a reference, we, uh, for the engineering education and design center project at UMaine, um, over the potential uh, costs related to COVID-19 um, safety precautions and additional uh, time and effort put into that, uh, if that were to um, have to extend over the full two years of the construction project could add up to um, up to almost a half a million dollars is estimated um, on a 50 plus million dollar project. So not um, a significant percentage, but certainly a significant dollar value. Um, we also have the bond project status report, uh, which is showing 29 projects. Uh, and with the addition of some matching funds, uh, we're looking at about $51.1 million worth of projects on that list. Uh, that list continues to, to change on a regular basis. And as projects um, move forward into uh, closer to construction, uh, we increase their, the project budgets. There's more and more overlap with the capital project status report. Um, we currently have 11 of those projects that are overlapping, and there's at least four more that will, will eventually uh, be brought to the board for approval as well. <laughs> Um, just a brief update on the Engineering Center project. As I mentioned before, we recently um, finalized the GMP, uh, Guaranteed Maximum Price, with the contractor. The construction continues. Uh, it is on schedule. And they've most recently done site work and utility work. Um, and there are a lot, of, a lot of work going on around the building. If anyone's been on the Orno campus in that area, it is quite hectic right now. Although uh, we're bringing services back up to the uh, 
buildings nearby to make sure that we're able to begin classes this week. So uh, no issues there. And concrete placement has begun on the foundations and uh, in, in ground site utilities uh, is well underway. Um, happy to share a link to uh, some still camera photos of the site if anyone's interested, <laughs> I'll send that along. Um, just a, a quick reference to the graphs, you'll see that the number of projects, uh, quant quantity number wise of projects is still in the range of 20 some odd projects, uh, but obviously the dollar value is increasing greatly uh, with the engineering center project uh, being approved up to $72 million now and, and the uh, increase in, in other large projects and uh, bond related projects. So. That's all I have, unless anyone has any questions for me. Thank you, Claire. Any, any questions from anyone? Claire, one quick question, uh, and it's probably not a quick answer, so I can follow up afterwards with maybe Chip and you. You mentioned GPM. Yeah. Uh, Guaranteed maximum price, yes. What does that really mean? <sighs> So uh, on the Engineering Education and Design Center, we, uh, we move that project forward with a construction manager at risk. Uh, so rather than going to design, um, bid, and then build, we, had, uh, we hired a construction manager during design, and they were part of the team uh, during the design process. And uh, when we came to final design, the construction manager was tasked with uh, putting together a guaranteed maximum price. They, they come to that uh, price by bidding out all of the individual trades within the project and then uh, putting that all together, making sure that all of the um, items are covered and there's no overlap where you know different trades might be doing something and, and put the whole package together as a guaranteed maximum price. So they deliver the project at this guaranteed maximum price, um, change orders will only be related to additional scope that the university decides to add um, or truly unforeseen, un unforeseeable items as needed. Uh, but at the end of the project, if they don't use all of the um, al uh, allowances and, and uh, contingencies which are in there, um, we don't have to pay all of that to them. Those come back. Uh, there's some shared savings, but some of that, most of that, or a portion of that will come back to the university. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Okay. Hopefully that's how it works. It is. <laughs> there you go. Okay. All righty. Uh, that was for information. And now we're, we're going to move to the, uh, Another information item is a fairly quick one. Uh, we sent out to the committee earlier uh, in this past month or two, the, the work committee, uh, the schedule for the work plan, the facilities and finance technology work plan. That's in the information, the package for information. Uh, there was only a slight change to it uh, where we uh, emphasize the need for a financial update at each of the meetings on how the system is doing uh, and, and in between if need be. Uh, so I, I just would open this to, is there any, any final comments on the work plan, any, any questions on it that uh, anyone might have having had looked at it? Uh, and have we captured uh, what, what some people may uh, wanna make sure is in that work plan? Mr. Chair? Yes. Right. Can I just add, uh, just to let the committee know as well that, um, and, and you'll see the footnote at the bottom that, but for the five-year capital plan, as well as for the multi-year financial analysis, those are typically due in May, and we're certainly not suggesting changing that on a permanent basis, but but for FY21 only, um, we are recommending that we come to you in November um, with essentially what would have been the work that we did back in May, um, the big the big pillars of the MYFA are obviously two big pieces of that are enrollment and state appropriation. Um, and both of those have been giant question marks, um, at least um, since um, we would have originally started this work. So did want to just note for the committee that for this year and this year only, we'll be bringing those 
um, to you uh, on a couple of occasions for your viewing pleasure. Thank you, Ron. All right, um, so that covers that topic. We're going to now come to the, uh, the first agenda item that we moved to here. Hopefully this will work for everybody's timing. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to President Karini Mundy and she'll introduce the, the uh, folks that are going to speak to this. This is a fairly significant uh, item to discuss. Uh, hopefully we'll have a very good discussion on it and uh, we'll see where it goes. Uh, this is on a building name re removal at the University of Maine campus, and uh, there's a lot of information to be shared, so I'm going to turn it, quickly turn it here over to President Karine Mundy. Thanks very much, Chair Gardner. Thank you all uh, for taking this item up. Um, this is, as uh, Chair Gardner notes, a significant item, and it's an especially significant item, of course, for us here at the University of Maine. Uh, there's been um, a fairly long history of discussion about this item that predates me and my time uh, here at the University of Maine. And so we come before you today with uh, a recommendation to remove the name of C.C. Little from the hall and to rename the hall. Um, I'll just give a very brief summary of a few highlights of the report, knowing that you've read it. Uh, but I have with me people who are very prepared to, uh, to say a lot more. Uh, the very uh, wonderful members of the CC Little Name Task Force, uh, chaired by Dr. Kenda Sheely, who is here with us. She's the Associate Vice President and Senior Associate Dean for Student Life, and you heard from her earlier. Dr. Liam Reardon, who is a professor of history. He's been at the University of Maine since 1997, and I believe Liam is on. And we uh, may be expecting Ms. Haley Cedar, who is an undergraduate honors student majoring in environmental horticulture class of 2021, who was one of the first people to come and talk to me directly about this matter last year. So, uh, so again, thanks to all of you, but also thank you to this remarkable task force that I think took up its charge, admirably wrote a thorough and comprehensive and in my view, compelling report that we take this action uh, that I've recommended to you today. There's a lot we can talk about here. Um, I'm going to to just hit a few highlights of the report and then we'll go to your questions and hear from others uh, as needed. First of all, the current context for considering the renaming of buildings is a very active and vibrant one um, nationally, as you well know, and only recently the main um, archives and museums organization prepared a statement on the removal of monuments and statues as recently as August, 2020. Uh, there's a wonderful, um, uh, book that Liam shared with us uh, titled um, Written in Stone, written by the legal scholar Sanford Levinson, uh, who has been at the University of Texas at Austin, a, a much longer and much more nuanced um, set of conversations really about what comes into play uh, at a philosophical level, at a principles level in, in all of this. And I just wanted you to know that we are doing this uh, with awareness of the national context. At the same time, this is a humane issue that has been on the table for um, a few years now. So Clarence Cook Little was president of the University of Maine from 1922 to 1925. The building was named for him in 1966 as a result of action taken by the trustees of the University of Maine and Leon Liam has the letter that uh, the board used when uh, they informed um, Dr. Little of this naming. Uh, the building continues in its original function today. It houses the departments of psychology and modern languages and classics. And it uh, also houses some of the largest lecture halls on the campus and is located prominently on the mall. President Little made an enduring positive contribution to science. He did work in genetics and he was key in the founding of the Jackson Laboratory in Bar Harbor, Maine. But as the report identifies, two major aspects of his career are disturbing today, and indeed uh, were disturbing to some uh, at the time. One is his notable um, leadership in the eugenics movement in the United States, a, a movement that sanctioned the identification and forced sterilization of individuals with uh, undesirable characteristics. He was uh, president of the organization and an active supporter and promoter. And secondly, he was the lead expert in the tobacco industry's attempts to, um, to obscure the link between um, smoking tobacco and the causes of cancer. 
And there's much in the report about this and there's substantial background uh, on his activities in both of these areas. Uh, that activity for us raises um, serious doubts about the appropriateness of having his name on a campus building uh, today. Note that subsequent to the delivery of the University of Maine's task force report, Dr. Edison Liu, president and CEO of Jackson Labs also made an announcement of their plans to remove founder C.C. Little's name from the Labs Conference Center um, because of his, uh, th these same historical elements in his work. Um, and Dr. Liu and I have discussed this a, a few times and I can talk to you more about what I know of his thinking. He was especially troubled by um, Dr. Little's involvement in suppressing scientific evidence in the tobacco industry areas. Um, as we note in the report, C.C. Little did go on to become the president of the University of Michigan and the University of Michigan removed President Little's name from the Little Building in 2018. I have also talked with you, Michigan President Mark Schlissel, about that process and can share more with you if you'd like. So we have this recommendation, we have a rationale. Um, as a part of this, the committee did beautiful work, I think, in laying out a, sec a set of principles to be considered around naming and really renaming as well that I want to call to your attention. They are on page three of the report. And in my view, these give us a, a bit of a, of a sense of the complexity of these kinds of decisions, which don't seem to lend themselves necessarily to, um, to a single consideration. So just moving through those six very, very uh, rapidly because you can read about them. Um, a consideration in naming buildings is a, a pedagogical consideration. That is to say, how can a name help us learn about our past and help us learn about the purpose of the university? Uh, how can it honor the distinguished lives of alumni or of uh, extraordinary contributors to the university? And so the pedagogy that is enabled through a name is something that, um, that our committee recommends we consider carefully. There is a due diligence effort as well, of course. Uh, the university owes it to itself and to those who follow us to do substantial research when a name is proposed. There's the matter of interpretation. How will that name be um, taken uh, as an interpretation by the university? And what are the stories that go with that name? And what are the stories that go into the processes for changing a name? There's a principle to do with commitment or a criterion. That is, when a university decides to name something after an individual, they are making a serious commitment to that individual and all that they represent. And there may well be legal matters to do with donations or expectations that go with naming that need to be looked at in the process of naming and of renaming. Uh, the notion of revision, and this has been, as, uh, as I've been reading this literature, this has been one of the most um, challenging points. That is to say the potential that by a renaming, we signal somehow that we are erasing history. And our committee was very clear on this point. We are not in any kind of way erasing the history of Clarence Cook Little and his time at the University of Maine. Um, as our committee wrote, and, and Liam can certainly speak to this, you know, as we have new historical discoveries and interpretations, they can sometimes produce controversy over space names. But we go on to say that this is part of meaningful engagement with the past. Uh, the naming decision by one generation may be appropriately questioned in the view of our committee by new historical perspectives achieved by a later generation. Uh, and then finally, the notion of historical and institutional context closely related to what we have just spoken about um, we are an institution that is about research and the continued growth of knowledge. And as that knowledge grows, we learn more and we propose new decisions based on that. So again, we can talk at great length about any of this. I just would add a couple of things. First of all, um, the task force vote was unanimous. And as a next step, I have assigned a new task force and charged them with the following. They were to re review the naming uh, our criteria that are in these principles in this report, and then use them to propose a new name following input from the community. And that process is under underway right now. So we don't bring you a proposed new name at this time, but we simply bring you this uh, proposal to, uh, to remove Dr. Little's name. I just want to be clear and to add that Dr. Name's 
Dr. Little's portrait remains in the library. There are other things um, on this campus. His papers are currently here at the University of Maine, although the family is requesting return of those papers. And we are examining that with our council now because that's complicated. Uh, in any case, probably enough from me. And I ur urge you to raise your questions on Kenda and Liam. And I don't know if Haley's joined us yet. Um, she has, okay. We'll be happy to give you more context and um, to talk this through. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, so let's open it up for, uh, for any comments or questions. This is a fairly significant uh, item. Uh, a lot of good hard work gone into it. Uh, a lot of information has been shared in the report. And uh, I think we really need to give this some serious consideration in terms of uh, what the implications are and how we, how we move on this. So any, any comments or questions from folks? Mr. Chair? Yes. Yes, and we're good. I, I just want to say, I, I was really struck by, and want to give credit to President Freeney Mundy and the entire commission reading this report about that this was not a simple decision. This is not a, it was not a quick recommendation. Uh, it was a process that was started prior to all of the events of 2020. Um, and one that I think has had incredible thought and that we are really keeping good company with both Jax and with the University of Michigan here. Um, I think this is, to me, it's an opportunity um, by taking the name off of the building to both educate current students and alumni about where we are now as a university, where we've come. I agree with what the president said, uh, the, the portrait will still be there and other um, pieces of President, president Little's presidency, which was relatively short at the University of Maine, um, in fact, he was, I think he was the youngest president ever of the University of Maine. As much, I re, that's the one factoid I remember about him um, and before he went uh, to Michigan. But I think it's an opportunity to educate people about where we were and where we are. And actually overall, to the point of what Jackson Lab was talking about, I think where science has come um, because where eugenics was at, at one point in time, something that there were some scientists who thought, yeah, this is the way it should go. And we've learned since that that is not the best way to go. And like science has learned, we can learn. And my hope is that it'll be an opportunity for the campus to choose a new name representative of where we are now and where we want to be. Uh, and we certainly, I mean, I could come up with a bunch of names right now <laughs> that I think could be on the list. And I'll plan to submit them Sunderland. during public comment um, when the time comes. Uh, I will not say any of them now, but I have a list to populating in my brain. And I just want to say, I just, I was so appreciative of how thoughtful this process was, how detailed, how inclusive, um, and how multifaceted the perspectives were that led to this unanimous decision. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Others? Uh, Chair? Yes. Uh, I'd just like to make a quick comment. Number one, I'd like to thank uh, President uh, Freni Mundy uh, for her thorough and investigative process and the committee that she worked with. I thought it was very well done and uh, thoughtful, uh, which is critically important. And uh, uh, I, it, for me, it just comes down to lack of integrity and, and uh, especially in regards to the relationship with smoke and cancer. And uh, so it's a, it's, a simple, it's a simple decision for me. So I wanna thank you, President Friendly Monday for uh, your job well done. Thank you. Uh, Trustee Riley. Yeah, I would I would share Sam and Emily's um, perspectives. I think particularly so in light of the decision by Jackson and the University of Michigan, and for a research institute to have a named building of someone who so patently um, violated basic premises of research, even in the time, even in the moment. I think um, there can be no no decision but to support this task force's great work. Thank you, Trustee Riley. Um, Jim? Yes, Jim, go ahead. Um, so I, I certainly agree with what's been said, and I, I, I certainly want to uh, commend President Freeney Mundy uh, and, and her task force for the process that they followed in this. Um, uh, and bringing the board to us, uh, bringing it to the board in the way that they have done that. Uh, it's been thorough, it's thoughtful. I think it's in keeping with the traditions of scholarship and open and fair inquiry 
Um, and we should not be afraid to examine uh, decisions in the past uh, when information directs that we directs us to do so. I do think this is a um, I do think this is a more complicated situation than just this building and this individual's name. And um, it, it seems to me that uh, our resolution, and I'm, I certainly am going to support this uh, name change, but I think it needs to be accompanied by um, an examination by the board of what principles we would apply to uh, questions like this in the future. Our policy is very general. Um, I don't think it provides any real uh, guiding principles uh, for us to, to consider renaming uh, buildings. And, and as uh, the movement uh, around the country uh, continues to grow for re-examination uh, of uh, recognitions uh, of uh, people from the past, I think we have to tread very carefully, but we have to tread. And so I think we should be working to develop some guiding principles. And I would, um, I would like, when we get to the point of uh, having a, uh, a motion, I would like to offer an amendment that incorporates into it uh, the establishment of a board uh, working group of some sort. Uh, I would ask them, and I would certainly hope the board will support that in full at the, at the September meeting so that we can um, certainly take this uh, as an opportunity to correct what I think was a mistake at the time uh, and should never have been done, but also to um, set us up for being able to uh, approach these decisions with a, a clearer set of principles in support of, of whatever decisions of it, it is that this or future boards make. Thank you, Trustee yes. Rowan. I, I think you make some very good points there. Um, other comments and thoughts? Mr. Uh, Chair? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Yeah. Chairman. Um, I think uh, Chair Irwin uh, said some of my thoughts uh, very well. Um, I think we need to be a bit careful when we look through today's lens on what happened in the past. Um, but I also think this in the past, <laughs> this, this probably should have never been named. Um, and that, that also is the reason to slow down on naming somebody that's contemporary um, to a building because you don't have the benefit of uh, some time behind them. And I, uh, I can't, I'm going to ask Joan uh, if she texts me the name of the in, in granite or in stone book because I, I think that it sounds like the title gives us the caution that we need going forward on reacting too quickly to what's going on today. Um, on changing names or on putting a name on the building. I think uh, if we're going to have something that we want to put in stone that speaks to um, the ethics, um, who we are and who we aspire to be, that's, those are the names that should be on the buildings. Uh, I know we have d donors who earn or, you know, uh, contribute and, and make their way there. But even in those cases, um, we should be cautious about um, who, who winds up representing the university going forward. Um, and their research, their life um, should be an example of who we aspire to be and who our best nature is. And uh, Dr. Little was brilliant, um, but had some very uh, deep flaws in, in the way he looked at things. And I, I don't think that's who we aspire to be. Um, the brilliance part, yes but the, uh, the other components that we want to remove them for um, uh, the building certainly ring very true to me and should have at the time that they put his name on the building. So while I feel bad that his family will be, uh, is feeling wounded by this, and I would understand that as a family member, um, I also think it's, um, it's really the appropriate response and we'll join in with the others in uh, complimenting uh, President Ferendi Mundi on, and her committee on the thoughtfulness and thoroughness that they went through uh, this process and the recommendation uh, to remove um, coming after uh, some real serious thought and investigation. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. 
Um, I just want to build on uh, what Jim said, I think is interesting. And I think what's great about this report we have in front of us is it does provide the board with a starting point for a conversation around what those criteria might be going forward. I mean, this it's very comprehensive and I think, um, I don't know whether it has to be in, I don't know from a process standpoint, whether it becomes part of this resolution or it's just something we decide to do because we can do it, create a, a working group or a subcommittee. But I think that's a great idea to particularly provide guidance for us and for the campuses. Um, and I think it's gonna save us a lot of time and effort that we have this report in front of us now that uh, does provide a broader perspective, not just on uh, the little name, but on overall criteria and principles that can be used as we examine past namings and future namings um, for buildings. So I just wanted to voice my support. I think that's a great idea. And I think we're ahead of the game because we have this report in front of us. Thank you, Emily. I, I would agree. Um, I would go back to uh, question for you, Cheryl, and, uh, and, and I think also uh, uh, Jim Thalen is on. Have you got uh, have you got some wording that you could propose that we could add to the uh, resolution? Yeah, I, I do, and and um, if if it's helpful, I'll I'll, uh, I'll just read it and and yeah. try to indicate as I read it what's what's new uh, language as compared to what's in the proposed resolution. Um, so the, the resolution would be that the Finance Facilities Technology Committee forward this item to the consent agenda. I'm not sure I agree with the consent agenda idea, um, but let's just park that for one side for a minute. Um, uh, but forward this item to the September 28, 2020 Board of Trustees meeting for approval of the following resolution that, and then insert this language, acting under section six of board policy 803 end of insertion. The Board of Trustees approves the recommendations, plural, of the Finance Facility and Technology Committee to one, authorize the University of Maine system acting through the University of Maine to remove Clarence C. Little's name from the building on the University of Maine campus, which bears his name, and then add all of the following. And two, charge a board working group to consider the factors relied upon by the C.C. Little Hall name task force in its June 23rd, 2020 report and recommendation for this name change and determine whether these factors or other others should be expressly incorporated into board policy 803 to guide the board's consideration of future naming recommendations of this nature. Hmm. So I, would move that, I would move that. Um, Second. Yeah. All right, we've had a move by, by Jim and uh, seconded by uh, was it Jim or John Lee? Yeah. Can I just ask one, can I just make a clarifying statement just to make sure, because there are, are a lot of people on this call who have been working on this task force, that we are approved with this motion, just to make sure I'm saying it out loud in yeah. plain language, we are, we are agreeing with the committee's recommendation and they are good to move ahead with removing the name. And then as a second piece, we are going to take this work and create a working group of the board in order to update our own policies on naming but but they are not but but they are two separate things one the name removal is moving forward it is not contingent on number two yeah. i just want to be clear it's a good very good question emily I, I think what we're doing and let's be clear is the committee is moving the talk is approving and moving the removal of the name to the board it's it's an actual yes total yeah, board yeah. Decision. so it's not final until the board makes that decision but it is not contingent on the work group is what I want to make sure it yeah. is. A set, it's moving forward on its own to the board as is the recommendation of the working group. Did I understand the language correctly? I, yeah. yeah. I, I not, so. I, the intention is not to make one contingent on the other, but to put in front of the board, both of them and ask that the board approve both of them. Right. And uh, if we ran, if if it turned out that the board said we're going to do one but not the other, then you know the board will have sure. to hash out sure. what sure. that means they at the time. Sure. But but the goal is simply to put both of these in front of the board for action at the same Got time. It. I get it. Thank you. I'll support the motion. And if I might, I, I would like this not to be an item on the consent agenda. Um, I think this should be a regular agenda item. Um, yeah. 
because this is this is the beginning. Well, maybe it is, maybe it isn't the beginning, but it's a big enough issue that I think it, it ought to be openly discussed by the board and not uh, jammed through on the consent agenda. I would agree. Me too. I agree with that as well. Okay. So we would take it off the consent agenda. It would be moved to the board as a for formal item on the board agenda for discussion and approval. Both, both of them. And so should we take it? I think we've got it, the motion on the floor. It's been approved. It's been seconded by Trustee Donnelly. So I believe we can take a vote on the motion. Certainly. So we will be voting on the amended resolution that will go directly to the board, not the consent agenda. Correct. Trustee Kane. Yes. Trustee Collins. Yes. Trustee Doak. Yes. Trustee Donnelly. Yes. Trustee Irwin. Yes. Trustee Gardner. Yes. Trustee McMahon. Yes. Trustee Martin. Yes. Trustee Riley. Yes. The motion is carried. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we're now at the point in the uh, agenda where uh, we're going to uh, want to move into executive session. So could I have a motion, uh, motion for the Board of Trustees uh, meeting to go into executive session under the provisions of 1 MRSA section 405 6-C to discuss the conditions, acquisitions, or disposition of real property or economic development if premature dis disclosure of the information would prejudice the competition or bargaining position of the University of Maine system? So moved. Second. Moved move, move by. Trustee Collins and seconded by Trustee Martin. So we need a we need a vote on this, uh, Ellen. Yes, this is to go into executive session. Trustee yes. Kane. Yes. Trustee Collins. Yes. Trustee Doke. Yes. Trustee Donnelly. Yes. Trustee Irwin. Yes. Trustee Gardner. Yes. Trustee McMahon. Trustee Martin? Yes. Trustee Riley? Yes. The motion is carried. Thank you. So we'll move and I think, I think Heather will move us into executive session. And thank you everybody who participated throughout the, day, the morning so far. But a lot of good items there and good discussion.